Welcome everyone. The speaker today is Marco Perez de Rio. He is a first year student at the University of Lancaster and he will be talking about persistent homology. Uh, okay. Hi. Yes, I will be talking about uh, persistent homology as uh, stated by as Edward said and uh, the presentation uh, says. And basically for those of you that don't know, uh, persistent homology is a tool that's uh, basically being popularized for topological data analysis. And uh, I found a, a paper, came across a paper uh, that tried to generalize this idea of persistent homology that seems to be very, taking a lot of importance lately uh, in uh, category theory. And I found it pretty interesting and I wanted to expose it to you. Um, basically, I will start by defining what persistent homology is. I will uh, then go on to define the categorification of this persistent homology, so generalizing it to category theory, and then use uh, theories, um, tools from category theory and this generalization to prove what's called what's known as uh, stability theorem, which I will define later, but it's one of the most important theorems of uh, persistent homology. So I will assume that uh, most of you know about uh, homology and uh, category theory. If there's something that you don't know, just uh, ask me and I will answer. Uh, so let's start. Um, <clears throat> the persistent homology uh, is defined on a filtration of uh, topological spaces as the one that you see here. Uh, oops, changes page. Uh, by create by taking the inclusions of uh, these uh, homological uh, spaces, topological spaces, and seeing uh, their uh, their induced functors on the Keth homology. So the p persisting homology of uh, p persisting homology at level k of a filtration like the one is S is uh, the image of the morphism that comes induced by the inclusion between the space U sub A and U sub A plus P in the case homologies of the spaces U sub A and U sub A plus P. So the one that you can see here. Uh, an example of this uh, very common is going by Morse filtrations. So basically, a way for getting these um, topological spaces, this filtration of here, would be by taking a function uh, f from a topological space x to a field r, and just uh, denoting for every element a in r uh, the pre-image of all elements lower than uh, than r. So this way, uh, we can uh, obtain a filtration like this. Uh, an example we can get. Uh, taking as the topological space X, the um, SN sphere, uh, as in here. <clears throat> so we would have that the kth homology when I and we can take as, as function, just the function that uh, takes everything that is slower than uh, Z. For example, as you can see in the image, we can take as function from uh, the sphere to where the function that uh, assigns each point of the sphere to the, its uh, last coordinate. So in this example here that we can see of the sphere, we have that uh, for values of uh, a lower than minus one, uh, there is no point in the sphere that much there. So the homology of uh, u a for a min my lower than minus one is zero for both level zero and level n. Then for any value a between uh, minus one included and one excluded, we have that the homology of level zero of uh, the space is uh, <clears throat> just the field F. So in this case, the field F is R uh, because the sphere is connected, while the, the nth homology is zero because it's homotopically, homotopically equivalent to a point. And then when we have a lower than uh, three, lower on equal, sorry, greater or equal than a, then we have that the zero homology is still uh, the field and the nth homology is uh, also the field. 
as we should know from homology theory. So here we would have that the pers zeros persist in homology from uh, points lower than uh, minus one to points between minus one and one would be zero because the image from zero to the field F is zero. The persistent homology from uh, zero persistent homology from a point uh, greater uh, than minus one to something greater, it's uh, F, the field F, because here we have the identity, the inclusion induces the same inclusion here, this identity of fields. And uh, the same here for the nth persistent homology. So we have that it's zero from something lower than minus one to something lower to anything up, and this uh, F for something greater or equal than one to something greater than or equal than one or greater than that number. So <clears throat> there are several points, two points in this uh, image that we can see that are important where the homology changes. Uh, in particular, the we see the end homology. It has one point here that is the point one where the homology changes. This point we call the uh, critical point and we can so it's defined it here. Basically, a critical point is a point for which uh, the image, the part of the P between the, homology, the homologies induced by the inclusions is uh, not the identity. So for any interval of the point X. And uh, if there are finitely many uh, points with this characteristic, we say that uh, the homology, that the persistent homology is tame. So under these conditions, uh, we can uh, make an identification uh, just for every, we can number the critical points as in here and identify every critical no point for with uh, an integral number. So point C1 is identified with one, CN is identified with N, it is it. Uh, using this, uh, we can uh, use uh, classifications of uh, the AP uh, in order to see persistent homology as uh, the following um, FX model. Basically here, the functions that we were uh, using later, the function uh, here, the CX to something greater, is uh, now the action of X on uh, this model. And he would have that uh, MI is the <clears throat> homology at uh, level, uh, it's the homology at for, of the topological space UCI. Okay, remember that for everything between UCI and UCI plus one, um, the morphism is the identity. So there should be no problem there. And uh, we have here that only have to define MI equal uh, to UCN, but N is the top, in order to be able to perfectly define uh, this action of X and make this action of X actually coincide with the morphism. So in this way, we can uh, identify persistent homology uh, with an FX model. And here, using a structure of PADs, we can decompose this uh, FX model that represents this persistent homology into a direct sum, into the following direct sum that we can see here. Basically, um, basically what, what we see here, some uh, models and torsion models and some uh, free, free models. Uh, important thing uh, here is that uh, we can identify also these parts in an also easier way without using all the effect structure, but just as intervals. So this decomposition of the persistent homology can be identified by the intervals that go from uh, Ti to infinity so sorry, CTI to infinity uh, for every i that is in this direct sum. And uh, the intervals, the closed intervals that go from Rj to Rj plus Sj. Uh, basically, uh, this would be the points where uh, persistent homology starts and then dies. 
And these are the points from uh, where epistemology starts and then goes on uh, for infinity. As for example, the one that we had in the zero, the, the one that we had in zero that started in the zero homology that started at uh, zero here, this would be one of the free parts. Uh, so this is usually represented in uh, this way as uh, barcodes, these intervals. Here in this picture, there is none of the one that goes to infinity, but uh, we have seen an example, a simple example where this that goes to infinity actually exists. The important thing in uh, persistent homology that uh, we'll talk about uh, today and uh, these barcodes is that there's a distance uh, associated to these barcodes that actually uh, stabilizes the, um, the persistent homology. And this instance is known as barcode distance. So given two barcodes, uh, so two families of intervals, A and A prime, given this family, finite families of intervals, A and A prime, we define the barcode distance, uh, the, barcode, the barcode distance, also known as bottleneck distance, as uh, the infimum of all uh, functions uh, assigning intervals to A of A to either the empty set uh, or an interval of A prime, and that's adjective in this sense. So all elements of uh, A prime are identified with some, with either the zero or uh, the, the A, <clears throat> or an element of A. Of the supremum of uh, this spot of this distance for the intervals, and the distance on uh, two intervals is defined as this uh, set of factors, this uh, multiple cases that I will not uh, go over right now, but uh, basically go, and go an idea of uh, how close the two intervals uh, are. The intervals from here to here, that is not the F, basically tell uh, how much you, can, you have to move one interval to be outside of the other and this distance F uh, tell you how much you have to move one of the intervals to be, to be inside the other or to not be uh, connected or to just move out of one interval. So <clears throat> important thing about this distance is that uh, there exists a theorem called uh, known as stability theorem that says that given a topological space X and functions F and uh, G that go from this topological space X to R and uh, denoting by AF and AG the barcodes obtaining um, by the Morse filtration of F on X. So the same way we did with the essence sphere. <clears throat> then the bottleneck uh, distance between these two barcodes is lower or equal than the, than the L infinity distance between these two functions. This usually is proven in a, which much more tameless conditions on the functions f and g, like f and g must be continuous and or so, but we will see later that uh, using category theory, this we will be able to prove this uh, without putting any extra condition on here, which I find very interesting. <clears throat> so uh, we can now go on to, to the categorification of the persistent homology. So we saw before that uh, we could uh, decompose uh, tame persistent homologies into intervals, basically. So what we define now is uh, <clears throat> diagrams, XA, so basically functors that go from uh, the category, the order category of R, the category given by R and with R was given by the order relation to the field uh, of vector spaces over F, uh, to the ve category of vector spaces over the field F. And we define uh, these simple diagrams xi for each interval i uh, in R as uh, being uh, the field F, the vector space F, if uh, the point x is in i and zero otherwise. <clears throat> and we define uh, the image of the arrows as being uh, the identity if both uh, extremes belong to the interval and uh, zero otherwise. So basically in here, we would have that uh, any interval going from here to here is zero. If we image this as being uh, 
one of the intervals. Any xi frame from here to here is zero, from here to here is identity, and from here to here is zero again. So we can see how this relates with the persistent homology. So with this uh, definition, we can define a finite type diagram, which uh, we define as a finite direct sum of uh, these uh, simple uh, diagrams. And we can see how this can relate to the same persistent homologies just by replacing these i's for the persistent homologies. And we can make this direct sum because we are in an um, in an abelian category. The vector space category is abelian, then the diagram is abelian. So uh, we have an uh, equivalent of persistent homology in uh, category theory. Let's go now to define uh, the barcode distance. Uh, in order to define the barcode distance, uh, we need to introduce a little bit of notation. Uh, this analogy will be given by something that we call uh, <coughs> interleaving distance. So here we define these punctures for every x in uh, in R, positive x. We define a functor tx that sends uh, i to x plus pi. And then we define the natural transformations between the identity and tx. And x that's, does the same, sends uh, y to n plus y, basically. So with this in mind, we can now define the epsilon interleaving of uh, two diagrams, F and G, uh, in a category C. See that here we are not imposing uh, the category C to be the factor spaces, but uh, any category C will do, uh, as long as it's a billion. <clears throat> I know, any category C, sorry. Uh, for example, you know, the one of topological spaces. And we define uh, they, uh, we say that two punctures, F and G, in this uh, diagram are epsilon interleaved if there exists a natural transformation, uh, P and C, from S, F to the translated function, uh, G, T, A, T epsilon, so it just moved epsilon, and C from G to F, T epsilon such that the following diagrams uh, commute. So basically we can uh, do phi and then C, and it will be the same as uh, going up naturally in the functor F. Okay, <clears throat> so just going up naturally. And the same thing for uh, G. Uh, important thing about uh, this definition of uh, epsilon interleaving is that uh, if two functions f and g are epsilon interleaved uh, for any positive epsilon, and we have any epsilon prime, which is uh, strict, which is greater than uh, the epsilon, then the functions f and g are also epsilon prime interleaved. And uh, this can be seen by the following commutative diagram uh, that give, in fact, the interleaving. Uh, we see that in this diagram, this triangle here, I don't know if you can see my mouse when I'm circling the triangle, I guess so. This triangle here is uh, <clears throat> commutative, commutes, uh, because of the definition of uh, epsilon interleaving and because F and G are epsilon interleaving. This square here uh, commutes because uh, as we said earlier, N Epsilon is a, epsilon bar is a natural transformation. Here, epsilon bar denotes the difference between epsilon prime and epsilon, and epsilon. And then we have that uh, since this commutes and this commutes, then going down here by C, then doing the natural transformation, then going up by C, and then again, the natural transformation is the same as doing the natural transformation n to epsilon prime. So here I forgot, yes, n to epsilon prime, the, the natural transformation that goes from fx to fx plus to epsilon prime. I haven't said it uh, later, but the composition of these two natural transformation is basically the adding the, the values that are below the natural transformation. 
So if we now define f prime, f c prime to be this composition and c prime to be this composition here, we have that this in fact commutes. And since we can do the same thing uh, reversing g and f, then we have that the composite also commutes and then uh, f and g and also epsilon prime intermute. <clears throat> Since this uh, happens, we can now define uh, the epsilon interleaving with the epsilon interleaving distance that we haven't defined shown yet that this is interleaving distance. And the, as the intimum values of epsilon for which to, to diagrams f and g are epsilon interleaved. Uh, this is, uh, I call a distance, but it's not uh, precisely a distance because it can have values of infinity. For example, for example having uh, the interval from zero to infinity is the distance between the simple uh, diagram associated to the interval uh, associated to the interval that goes from zero to infinity uh, to the distance of the simple uh, diagram of the interval zero. That distance is uh, infinity. And defining uh, and it's there's also intervals that do not uh, have have distance zero but are not the, the same but anyway uh, this is an extended pseudometric which means that besides these two conditions it satisfies all other conditions of uh, metric space so it's uh, symmetric which is trivial because of the definition of epsilon interleaving which is symmetric itself uh, the distance between uh, f and f for any diagram f is zero. We can we normally have to take as interleaving the identity. And it satisfies the triangular <laughs> inequality, which can be seen by the following diagram. If f and g are a interleaved and uh, g and h are b interleaved, then we can take uh, a value epsilon <clears throat> and we will have by the previous linears that there is an epsilon interleaving and a plus epsilon interleaving between f and j and there's a b plus epsilon interleaving between g and h and thus uh, we have that this diagram here commutes uh, in the arrows where i haven't written anything there's the natural transformations uh, eta with the corresponding the important values so this commutes this commutes this square commutes because this natural transformation so all the triangle commutes. So if the distance between F and G is A, and G and B is A, we have an A plus B plus two epsilon interleaving between F and J and H, and making H tend to zero, we obtain that the distance between F and H is at the very least A plus B. So we obtain the triangular inequality. <clears throat> Okay, uh, with this in mind, we have that this interleaving distance. Let's see how this works with the finite type diagrams and not only with general diagrams. Then for finite type diagrams, uh, we have that uh, an interleaving, which remember is a natural transformation from F to G, can be decomposed as uh, many natural transformations between uh, the, the simple diagrams X, I, and the simple diagrams x i prime or uh, zero, just the x zero, the x empty set. So doing this, uh, we can see that the epsilon interleaving, uh, that any epsilon interleaving arises from this. So <coughs> the epsilon interleaving will be given by the infimum of the sub maximum value of the supremum value from all this interleaving. Here I have written supremum, but actually since A and A prime are finite sets, it's the maximum. So basically the real, the lowest interleaving between uh, F and G will be, will be given by the way in which we can associate the, the intervals in A with the intervals in A prime and the lowest interleaving we can give between uh, the XA and XA prime. So we have that the <clears throat> interleaving distance, I will explain it just like this for this, just generally with these ideas, not go more in detail, is in fact the infimum of the supremum of the distances between 
XA, XI, and XI prime. Here I wrote it incorrectly. There should be XI and XI prime, uh, X sub FI, but uh, you get the idea. So uh, with this, we have the symmetry with the barcode distance. <clears throat> and uh, we can, in fact, prove that the distance uh, between these intervals is the same as the barcode distance between the intervals i and i prime. Here again, I forgot uh, this x shouldn't be here, just the i and i prime. Uh, the proof is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, just uh, right here, the idea of the proof. And it's that uh, these intervals, it's just checking all cases, case by case, and taking in mind that uh, only natural transformations that you can do from x i and x i prime are uh, pretty much everywhere zero or uh, zero and set in some specific points uh, are where it must not be non-zero. So it's either zero or, or the identity. And we can see here that uh, checking just uh, this particular fact, we can check that the distance in fact uh, works for every case of the barcode distance that we defined uh, here. So for each one of these cases, the distances will work. Pretty straightforward to check. <clears throat> so uh, with this in mind, I think I will go on to the final part of the presentation, which is the proof of the <clears throat> stability theorem itself. So to prove the stability theorem itself, uh, we'll start showing that the um, that the interleaving distance is preserved by punctures. So basically, if I have uh, two diagrams f and g in uh, this category, two diagrams f and g that go from R to C, and the functor H, for example, the homology functors that goes from C to D. For example, here if we take as H the the topological uh, the homology functor we would have as C is this category of topological spaces and D is <clears throat> the category of vector spaces over a field F. And we want to prove that uh, this uh, homology, this, this functor, preserves uh, uh, the interleaving distance. So preserves interleavings. So the interleaving distance is at least lower. Uh, for this, take uh, any two functors, f and g, and take epsilon interleaves, p and c, between f and g. <clears throat> then because of these uh, interleavings, we have a commutative diagram, like uh, this one, but without the h's, the h in places, between f and g for every x in R. And uh, since h is a functor, then uh, it preserves this commutative diagram and therefore gives us this commutative diagram just by applying h to f g and the font and the arrows between fx and f g x plus epsilon and we obtain this commutative diagram and this commutative diagram is uh, is in fact gives us in fact an epsilon interleaving between HF and HG, which proves that uh, if F and G are epsilon interleaved, then HF and HG are also epsilon interleaved, and therefore the interleaving distance of HF and HG is lower or equal than the interleaving distance of F and G. <clears throat> With this, the other thing that we have is uh, the other lemma that we need in order to prove the stability theorem is uh, the following that giving a uh, topological space X and functions F and G, not necessarily continuous, no special condition on these functions that goes from the topological X to R. Then uh, the diagrams that are given by taking the inverse for each, if each F. So basically for each X we assign to the topological space uh, f minus one of minus infinity x, so just in a more, just as in a Morse filtration. Uh, then doing this, these two diagrams are interleaved by the 
infinity norm that by the distance given by the L infinity norm. So uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, we'll have that uh, these interleavings will be the inclusions. Uh, and in fact, we can take the inclusions as these interleavings because uh, by definitions of the L infinity norm, we have that, oops, that uh, GX is uh, included in FX plus epsilon. Yes. And uh, vice versa. So just taking the inclusions from GX to FX plus epsilon and from AFX to GX plus epsilon, we have that uh, the commutative Graham uh, diagram such as this one arises. <clears throat> so doing this, we have the interleaving of both sides and those both are epsilon interleaved. And uh, now we can finally prove the stability theorem. Uh, the stability theorem is just a combination of these uh, two lemmas. Uh, we have uh, that the, that uh, persistent homology is uh, identified by by the vector spaces that arise from this topological space uh, from these Morse filtrations. So we can take these diagrams. These diagrams are f g f minus g infinity interleaved. Uh, we apply then the homology fun the the homology functor, and we obtain that the diagrams HF and AG <coughs> are interleaved by F minus G sub epsilon. So have, have F minus G, have uh, this uh, L infinity distance uh, interleaving. And uh, therefore, the interleaving distance between HF and HG, with H the homology functor, is uh, lower or equal than uh, the L infinity distance between F and uh, G. So I think I am on time for uh, giving a room for questions. And I will uh, end the presentation here. Uh, thank you for your time. Any questions, uh, you can give it now. Okay, so thank you, Marco, for the talk. And um, does anyone have questions? Oops. Right, so then we should leave it here. Um, let's thank the speaker again, and we hope to see you all again in two weeks. Is it possible to ask questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I left a couple of minutes for this. Ah, no, because uh, no, I'm sorry to, to, to speak because I think this is a, a student seminar. I'm not. Ah, a, yes, hi. Student. Well, let, let's say I'm a grown up student. I'm, I'm still a student, but, but maybe older than others. So I didn't want to ask any question before other people. So I give priority to, to, to more, I would say, uh, probably. Uh, fresher questions uh, by other people. Uh, but uh, okay, um, I have to, yeah, two questions. One is uh, very, very easy, just a, a matter of, of uh, language. You said that the interleaving distance is a pseudo distance. This means that it's possible that actually two modules are at distance zero and not uh, be yes. isomorphic. Uh, why? Uh, yes, uh, just uh, the difference is uh, we can take the intervals to be an open interval and a closed interval. Ah, okay. And then the interleaving distance would be zero. Exactly. Okay. Okay. But in, in yes. practice, most people just uh, take a convention at the beginning, and then yes. uh, I, yes. I thought it was okay. a metric, precisely because of the isometry theorem. I think that, that the bottleneck distance is a true metric, right? Yes. We think the quotient, uh, this quotient of the it's for, for zero. Then we have uh, the distance, but we have uh, an extended uh, distance because it can have uh, values of infinity. Exactly. And, and then uh, just asking, uh, maybe you can say a word of why that the stability theorem is so important. Um, 
<laughs> because uh, well, you mentioned uh, yes, the case right. of Morse filtrations, but in the context of Morse filtration, it's not clear to see why it has an impact. Uh, uh, yes, this uh, has uh, is, is important in uh, data analysis, in topological data analysis, because, for example, you could have uh, this, the, these Morse filtrations could arise from uh, some data points, and if these data points are slightly changed, uh, for example, the filtration could be just uh, taking as the topological space X, uh, all uh, R n, R n, with many points there, and uh, as uh, the function f would be something that uh, uh, goes increasing on the goes making increasing spheres around these points uh, in the R n. So basically, assume that the function f assigns to every point on the R n the infimum of the distances to all of the points in the data set. So the, this uh, interleaving here, this uh, space here, would, uh, uh, could turn out to be just uh, some spheres growing in the RN. Uh, if we take the, that these points are slightly moved, uh, slightly to the right, slightly to the left, uh, some point is missing, or there are other points, then we will have uh, that the, the persistent homology won't change much from those. So the persistent homology will be uh, limited by the L infinity distances between these two functions. So basically, the persistent homology of the data set will remain more or less the same. So I don't know if this answers your question. I think, Marco, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, um, I have a slight objection about the use of categorification, but that's not yes. your fault, it's just uh, Bouvenik and Scott. Look, uh, uh, what you have done is using the language of category theory, uh, yes. a really nice proof of the stability theorem. Yes, I enjoyed it pretty much. I really uh, keep the idea. Thank you for, for the input. But uh, when in mathematics, when we uh, use the word categorification, we usually mean that in certain category theory, leads to better insight and new results that were unexpected uh, from other yes. sources. So I really yeah. encourage you, and you, this is probably your research, uh, direction, to use category theory to prove something which was not known before. And, and then you <laughs> will be able to really speak of categorification. <laughs> You're right about this one. And the, the really cool thing that comes from this, it's, I mean, it's just a generalization of uh, the, the stability theorem that it's not, uh, that I, at least this is the only place I found it uh, with this much generality. Usually it's stated with a lot of naming conditions of the functions uh, f and g. Thanks for the very nice talk, Michael. Yes. Thank you for- uh, Glad to see you. Thanks for your points. See you around. Wait, are there any other questions? So then, yeah, okay. let's, let's stop here. And yeah, thanks for the talk. Thanks.